we showed very briefly that clip of Biden going to the border, and we heard at the end of uh, of uh, way too early, we heard that there's a belief, Swazi believes, hey, he won on Long Island by leading into the issue. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me time and time again, Willie, whenever you think, yeah, you know, when people are telling you you have to run away from an issue because it may be dangerous, that's when you run straight into it. I mean, when we, a uh, long time ago, we, we Republicans had to slow down the rate of growth in Medicare because the Medicare trustees said it was going bankrupt. So, of course, you know, everybody said that we, you know, slashed Medicare. We threw grandma out in the street. <laughs> and I, I was asked about it my first campaign event, and which was unfortunately at a retirement home, <laughs> um, and uh, the debate. And then, you know, I got attacked by the Democrat. I said, well, okay, you know what? I'm going to make this entire campaign about Medicare. And I've told this story before. You would think that that would hurt me with senior citizens. I actually, you know, had the highest uh, approval rating among senior citizens at the end of that campaign for like 150 districts that you know, a pollster, Glenn Bolger, with Public Opinion Strategies, polled. I ran into what was supposed to be the great weakness. My opponent, my, my, uh, my friends that were scared of it got crushed. But I ran into it. And yesterday at the border, you had Joe Biden doing something that Tom Swasey did that I'm just, every Democrat in America needs to do. They need to run straight into this issue of southern border security like Joe Biden did yesterday because Republicans have screwed it up. They, they could have had an issue, but they screwed it up. And I thought yesterday illustrated perfectly the difference between Biden and Trump at the border. Biden actually asking Trump, help me out here. Yeah. Yeah, that was an extraordinary bank shot that the president pulled, well, not just going to the border and recognizing exactly what you're saying is that maybe he's fallen into it backwards because of the help of the Republicans, but he's got an issue now that he can say, guys, I do want to fix this. In fact, we helped push along this bipartisan legislation in the Senate. Why aren't you taking it up? And the bank shot now, as you point out, Joe, was saying, Donald Trump, this issue is too important. What do you say you and me work together on this? Join me. Together we can fix this problem. So that, that moment alone speaks to how this issue has shifted in the favor of Joe Biden. I mean, it certainly wasn't for, for a long time. It was one of his great weaknesses. But now with that assist from House Republicans, he can, as you say, run on this. You really can. And you look with who Joe Biden's with. He's with border security agents who begged Republicans to pass the bill. And even more importantly, um, both President Trump and Biden were there at the same time. So you really get a split screen at not just their messages, but their approach to this and the fact that mm, the Republicans passed on it. So Donald Trump is trying to steal thunder on something that he told his people, his minions in Congress, to pass on so he could have it later after he runs, so it doesn't hurt his campaign. The messages... Uh, to voters were very different, starkly different. Um, also ahead, we're going to President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump both visited Texas towns over the at the southern border yesterday and delivered very different messages. I understand my predecessor's legal pass today. So here's what I would say to Mr. Trump. Join me or I'll join you in telling the Congress to pass this bipartisan border security bill. We can do it together. The United States is being overrun by the Biden migrant crime. It's a new form of uh, vicious violation to our country. There's no red state or blue state where I come from. They're just communities and families looking for help. This governor, Newscom from California, isn't that his name, Newscom? Uh, what he's done to California is unbelievable. So instead of playing politics with the issue, why don't we just get together and get it done? But this is a Joe Biden invasion. Horrible. Crooked Joe is the blood of countless innocent victims. Compromise is part of the process. That's how democracy works. That's how it's supposed to work. We did much better in 2020 than we ever even thought about doing in 2016. And very bad things happened. We work for the American people, not the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. We work for the American people. Nobody explained to me how allowing millions of 
people from places unknown, from countries unknown, who don't speak languages. We have languages coming into our country. We have nobody that even speaks those languages. They're, they're truly foreign languages. Nobody speaks them. And they're pouring into our country, and they're bringing with them tremendous problems, including medical problems, as you know. What are we, what are we supposed I to do can't. with that? I mean, see, Why do they, people are actually voting? Is, is there really one languages. person voting for Not that just guy? Foreign languages. Who's, how stupid truly would you have to be? Foreign. He can't complete a sentence. He can't complete a thought. He he talks about Crooked Joe is the uh, blood of countless victims. This is vicious violation. I mean, he just does he again, even like think about what he's going to say? Does, does somebody prepare? give him a little piece of paper know. or something? He, like because that that's clear. He doesn't. He doesn't even think. Well, but I, I think I, I really well, don't know, Willie. He maybe com- you can give us some insight on it. Uh, but but he looks so lost and confused. He jumbles his words. He tries to read a little bit. He's trying and to then, be nasty. And, but... then, and then, yeah, trying to be nasty. But when he does that fifth grade or really five-year-old taunt, Newscom? Is that his name, Newscom? <laughs> I mean, talk about losing about 18 miles off your fastball. Yeah. I mean, that guy... This guy's pitching 72 miles an hour down the middle of the plate. I mean, <laughs> it's it's not it's not good. And again, I uh. just have to bring it up. He's lying, as he always does when he talks about the border. When he ran and was talking about the border wall, Barack Obama and Joe Biden had illegal border crossings on the southern border at a 50-year low. He's just making this stuff up every day. And then the numbers exploded under him. Then they exploded even higher under Joe Biden. And Joe Biden and and Senator Langford, the most conservative senator uh, in, in probably in, in the United States Senate, and, and Democrats came together in bipartisan bill. And listen to this. Joe Biden saying yesterday, let's put politics aside. Let's come together and pass the toughest border security bill ever, which, of course, those border security agents that Joe Biden is with right there, their union came out and begged Donald Trump and Mike Johnson to stop playing politics with the safety and the security of Americans. The guy on the left worked with hardcore Republicans and took a position that progressives in his party hate. But he came to the center, he came to compromise with Republicans, and actually even went further right than most of his party was comfortable with, and they got a deal. And then the guy on the right said, don't pass the toughest security border legislation ever. It might help Joe Biden. I mean, that's where we are right now. Donald Trump has said he wants the crisis to continue unabated for the next year. Yeah, and he's given that order to the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, who's very happy to take it and to turn his back on this bipartisan legislation led by that That noted liberal squish, James Lankford, one of the most conservative members of the United States Senate, who worked for months to put this together, said this is what you said you wanted from us. Here it is. This is as good as it's ever going to get. And yet the House won't take it up on the orders, as you say, of Donald Trump. So as the presidential election fast approaches, there is a rising tide of independent voters sweeping the nation. A recent poll shows 45 percent of Americans now identify as unaffiliated with any political party. A big move away from traditional allegiances that is reshaping the political landscape. And joining us now with charts on this is former Treasury official and Morning Joe economic analyst, Steve Ratner. Steve, thanks so much for being with us. You know, a lot of people look at this time and um, and and in the future and they're thinking that maybe the rise and possibly fall of Donald Trump or the rise, fall and rise of Donald Trump is going to be the story, really the political story for the next 10, 20 years, the impact on on the country. I've got to say, politically, the rise of independence, which you're looking at right now, I think will be far more significant because it does seem that we're about to break what John Meacham has called that 150-year duopoly that has controlled American politics. 
Yeah, Joe, and actually the two things I think are connected, but we'll see what everybody else thinks when I uh, show you some numbers here. So in terms of uh, Mika's lead-in and this whole rise of independence, let me just show it to you what it looks like in, on a chart. If you go back to 2004, roughly an even division among Republicans, Democrats, and independents, and it has simply gone like this, like, a, like Jaws. Uh, Republicans and Democrats have ended up in the same place, although Democrats did better for a while. But now, as Mika said, independents are up to 45 percent. And what does this reflect? I think it reflects to a considerable degree people's unhappiness with the way our democracy operates. Only 27 percent of Americans believe that uh, our system is working either well or very well. The rest think it's not working very well. There, there are 32 states that permit party registration. A lot actually don't. Those of us who live in those states don't really understand that, but that's the way it is. Disproportionately large number of independents in states that don't permit party registration. And all of these green states, there was an increase in independence uh, over this period of time, from 2014 to 2024, a few states where it went down, but basically independence on the rise. You know, I was uh, I was at a, a school event last night, uh, Steve, and, and and talked to several parents. Uh, were, we're just talking, just in general, and and uh, talking about independence. And everybody seemed to come to the same conclusion. Um, and I, I found it fascinating. That, you know, they they say, "Where's the candidate that's economically conservative, that believes the United States should be involved in the world?" that believes that women uh, should have uh, control of their own bodies. Uh, and, and they just, just went, down, went down the list and uh, they were trying to make the point, uh, their, their view that you're making, uh, that you're about to make right now, I think, and that is that people are becoming more polarized, which is actually uh, driving a lot of Americans into looking for a third choice. Yeah, that's part of the point, that you have the, uh, the parties in the hands of a smaller and smaller number of people, so inevitably it becomes the extremists. The Democrats happily have maintained, I think, a more moderate stance, but when you see what's happened in the Republicans and with Trump, you have to look at the fact that many people have left the Republican Party as part of it. But let's take a look here at the trend, because what's also happening is that the red states are getting redder and the blue states are getting bluer. So the increase in... Uh, in, in um, presidential uh, registrations has moved toward blue states have gotten bluer, as I said, red states have gotten redder. There are only four states or five states that have gone the other way, Nevada and Utah, um, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Rhode Island have, uh, have become more red, and uh, Utah and Kansas, oddly enough, have become slightly more blue. But basically the trend is that as party registrations move, the red states get redder, the blue states get bluer. Why does this matter? This matters because our elections are being decided in a smaller and smaller number of places. Back here in 2000, 47 percent of our of the elections by county, we're looking at this by county, were decided by 20 percentage points or less. Today, only 22 percent of our elections are being decided by 20 percentage points or less. That means that all the rest is 80 percent almost of our elections are being decided by more than 20 percentage points in, in a given county, which means again that a smaller and smaller number of voters are essentially deciding our elections because we have so many uncompetitive races. So Steve, uh, your third chart looks at primary turnout, and I'm curious how, it, how you think this plays into all of this. So given what I just said about how more, uh, more and more elections are decided in fewer and fewer places, the primaries become more important. And you go back to my point mm -hmm. about the de decrease in party registration, and you combine that, and what you find is that the number of voters who are, can't vote in a primary because they are not registered to a party has gone from 15 million to 27 million. So in, these voters are effectively shut out from deciding who their nom the nominee is, and therefore, since the nominee has become so much more important, less, less uh, able to influence the outcome of an election. And then you talk about the fact, you talk about turnout. So turnout actually in general elections has gone up a bit. We've succeeded in convincing people they should vote 38% to 47%. Turnout in primaries hasn't moved at all. It's stuck down to 20%. So only 20% of Americans are voting in these primaries. In New York and Virginia, in the last primary, only 3% of people voted. 
And these are people deciding the nominees in states that are often not competitive. And so, in effect, they're choosing the winner. It's such an important and interesting point. Something we looked at, Steve, around Iowa when there was this shock that Donald Trump had won so big. And then you looked at it, actually, he won just over 50 percent of a tiny turnout among Republicans in the state of Iowa. Morning Joe economic analyst Steve Ratner bringing the heat, bringing the charts. Thanks, Steve, as always. We appreciate it. So, Sam, let's talk about the impact of a growing number of independents on a national election, which is what we're seeing right now. You kind of call the people Joe was talking to at the school event last night the normies, people who are not immersed in Twitter and cable news 24 hours a day out living their lives, and they just want government <laughs> to do things and stop the, stop the nonsense and actually get something done. What, uh, what is the impact? Let's just look at this election right now. Who does Joe Biden, who does Donald Trump need to be talking to to swing them? Right. Well, I, you know, I think there's like two types of independence. There's the normies, uh, who are people who just don't want to be totally engaged in the in the fight uh, 24 hours a day, who wants some sort of centrist model of governance, and attitudinally, I think, just want people to chill out, right? Those are those are the yeah. traditional independents. And then there's like independents who, you know. Maybe support um, Marjorie Taylor Greene or maybe support RFK Jr., who, you know, really have a, a sort of a weird convergence of uh, policy interests and political interests uh, and maybe some sort of skepticism vaccine for interests, for instance, that gets them involved in governments. Those are not your traditional third party moderate and in, independent. So I just want to make that distinction. Uh, but both of them will have a huge impact on this election. I mean, it's possible that RFK. Uh, Junior's candidacy will get, you know, double digit support potentially in many of these critical swing states. And who knows uh, who that takes the most from? Um, we haven't had that type of level of support since uh, since Ross Perot in the election. But, yeah, I mean, for Biden and for Trump, they're going to have to contort in certain ways, I would suspect, to try to appeal to those types of voters. It's just trying to figure out which class of independents will take the most from their candidacy. I think when the transcript mm. comes out, it's going to read. It's going to read well for them because they did a great job prepping for a read, but that's. Oh, but, interesting. But the reality is, yeah, yeah. But when it, when you get down to it and you start parsing the words, you start realizing, oh yeah, yeah, that's that's very interesting. Well, what? So, uh, quote: When the transcript comes out, it's going to read well for him. That was Republican member of the Oversight and Judiciary Committee, Andy Biggs of Arizona, with that assessment of the transcript of the Hunter Biden closed door deposition to which he received interesting. Yesterday, the House Oversight and Judiciary Committees publicly released the full 229 page transcript of Hunter's testimony as part of their impeachment inquiry into his father, President Biden. The document, with some redactions, addressed numerous topics, including Hunter's laptop, laptop addi uh, addiction, Joe Biden, and Donald Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, was mentioned. Hunter attempted to draw a contrast with the scrutiny he's received from the committees and questioned why they were not probing Jared Kushner for his own foreign business dealings. When a lawmaker asked Hunter whether he worked with foreign governments, he responded, I never worked for a country. I am not Jared Kushner. Hunter also pushed back on Republicans for not investigating the money Kushner's firm received after he left the White House in 2021. When Jared Kushner flies to Saudi Arabia, picks up $2 billion, comes back and puts it in his pocket, okay, and Trump is running for president of the United States, you guys have any problem with that? Hunter Biden also testified he never crossed very bright lines of asking his father to help his business partners and was always sensitive at keeping his father at arm's length. One thing that we, that I was fully aware of my entire life, is that my dad was an official of the United States government, he said. And there were very bright lines that I abided to and that I was very, very cognizant of and made certain that I never engaged with my father in asking him to do anything on my behalf or on behalf of any client of mine. 
Joining us now, a Democratic member of the House Oversight Committee, Congressman Dan Goldman of New York. So what did they find? I mean, what happened here? I hear there was even chuckling at times at the stupidity of it all. I mean, this is a lot of time being spent trying to, I guess, impeach the president at some point here. Is there anything? Zero. There's absolutely nothing. And the remarkable thing about this 229 page transcript when you read it is how little of it relates to Joe Biden, which is the ostensible purpose of this investigation, which has now moved into an impeachment investigation after uh, with 14 months in the, in the books here. There are a couple things you read that I think were are very important. When Hunter Biden asked the Republican members of Congress, do you have any problem with that? There were a couple who said yes. It's not in the transcript, but they said mm. yes, and others were nodding because he did a, a very good job of confronting them with the difference between what he did, which was dealing in international business with non-government officials, non-government entities, versus Jared Kushner, who received $2 billion from the Saudi Arabian government right after he was the point person on Middle East policy for the Trump administration, and after the advisory board of the Saudi government's investment arm recommended not investing in him because he had never done what he was starting to do. And the contrast is so stark because it is so obvious that what Jared Kushner did deserves investigation. And what Hunter Biden mm -hmm. did at this point is just purely punitive and purely attacking someone who has made mistakes and admitted to them, but who's not a public official and never has been. Uh, and it's purely being done right now just to provide election fodder for Donald Trump. Yeah. Congressman, good morning. It's good to have you back with us. Yeah, you kind of led me to my question, which is that Jared Kushner, his name came up several times in that uh, interview, that deposition yesterday. Jared Kushner received $2 billion from the Saudis, and James Comer, Chairman Comer, and others want to talk about the $1,300 car payments for a Ford pickup truck that he, that Hunter Biden received from his father and then reimbursed later. Um, is, is it your sense that there are any Republicans who believe that this has just gone on too long, that it is a farce, that all of their star witnesses have now become either fugitives or indicted by the Justice Department, that they come out of these meetings and they tweet breaking news, Hunter Biden says this or that, and it never amounts to anything, that the chairman of the committee, James Comer, continues to say, well, there's a lot of smoke here. We're going to find that fire pretty soon. Or do they just concede that this is something that maybe on the margins hurts Joe Biden among a certain subset of voters, so they're just going to keep this ball in the air through the election? Well, I think there are many Republicans, and Congressman Biggs' uh, comment about how the transcript is going to read well for him, he's one of the staunchest supporters of impeachment. And if he's saying that, that indicates that there are many, many others who really question this. Even Matt Gates has gone on in uh, the air and said there's uh, not enough to impeach him here and that his mem the other members of the Republican Party will not vote. They don't have the votes for impeachment. They cannot bring this to the floor. And what you have is Hunter Biden putting the nail in the coffin on any allegations which were bogus and unsupported to begin with <laughs> about foreign influence peddling on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have these, these bogus Burisma allegations which have been debunked over and over, and now it comes out that the source that they were relying on, the only evidence they had was a confidential human source's reporting to the FBI that was uncorroborated and unverified in the face of so much evidence to the contrary. And now we know not only was that source lying, but that the source was working with Russian intelligence to plant this story in order to interfere in the election. And so it's not just, oh, this investigation has blown up and it's over. It's now at the point, Willie, where if the Republicans continue to go down this impeachment investigation, they are knowingly doing it 
to assist Vladimir Putin in interfering in our upcoming election. So it's far more serious than just, oh, James Comer uh, at this point is an embarrassment and should be embarrassed with such a terrible investigation. It's now much more serious that these House Republicans are going to be complicit in Russia's effort to install Donald Trump as president again. Congressman, I'm, I'm trying to understand the politics here. Steve Ratner was up here before showing the kind of the growing independence in the swing voters. Tell me the one voter that actually would give a crap about this. That's what I don't understand. Forget, forget the moral issue and as, as the points that you're picking. From the politics of it, it it's innate. Well, the politics are interesting because you obviously have the far right and the ecosphere of Newsmax and Fox News, Sean Hannity peddling this. Over but they're already, over. they already have those voters. But yeah. they are already locked in. And uh, I think it's, it's going to backfire. And I, I've said this for a while because it was very clear through all of these depositions, most of which I sat in on, that these witnesses that were their witnesses, they brought them in because they were the ones that were going to prove their case. Every single one of them essentially said, no, I have no evidence connecting Joe Biden to anything that Hunter's doing. And so they've overreached here. They have clearly overreached and they have not corrected course. And what that is telling the American people, especially when you compare the ineptitude of this Congress, that we continue to not be able to get anything done because the Republicans can't get their house in order. And so you have the dichotomy of them pushing this Hunter Biden bogus story that at this point is just harassment of Hunter Biden versus <laughs> doing really nothing is. for the American people, got, getting absolutely nothing done, not solving the border crisis, not bringing national security funding to the floor, not funding our government. And it's so clear that all these Republicans can do is politics. And those independent voters who are tired of the partisanship and want to get something done, see Joe Biden compromising on immigration legislation in the Senate. They see Joe Biden for the first two years of his presidency passing historic legislation that boosts manufacturing and semiconductor and brings jobs back to America, raises wages. And on the other hand, when the Republicans have been governing, they literally cannot pass any bills amongst themselves in the House. And you have the Senate working in a bipartisan way, and the House Republicans are the block, are the obstacle to solving America's problems, and partly because they're spending so much time on these absolutely absurd investigations of Hunter Biden and Secretary Mayorkas. You know, it's just, I mean, I'm still stuck on the soundbite that we came into this whole segment with. Uh, Stand. I mean, I think it was Andy Biggs, a Republican congressman, saying, you know, it's this this transcript is going to read well for him, you know, kind of like you had to be there to really see the crime. Well, then make it public. He showed up. He wanted to do this publicly and they wouldn't let him. I mean, at every turn, there has been nothing. Um, and a lot of work needs to be done in Congress that is actually serious to the future of this country. So it's it's frustrating on many levels. Democratic member of the House Oversight and Homeland Security Committees, Congressman Dan Goldman, thank you very much for coming on the show this morning. Thanks for having me. We appreciate it. Ten cases of measles have been reported in Florida now, with the outbreak starting at Manatee Bay Elementary School in South Florida's Broward County. Eight percent of kindergartners in that county are not vaccinated for measles, according to state data. Florida Surgeon General Joseph Latipo, appointed in 2021 by Governor Ron DeSantis, has come under heavy criticism from medical experts in recent days for his response to the outbreak. Latipo, so far, has not advised parents of exposed children to have their kids quarantine or to be vaccinated if they have not already been. Since he was tapped for the job by Governor DeSantis, Surgeon General Latipo has amplified questionable medical advice and anti-vax talking points about the COVID-19 vaccine. Join us now, NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Vin Gupta. Dr. Gupta, it's good to have you with us. Um, so let's talk about 10 cases of measles. That as a raw number may not sound like a huge outbreak to people, but it is because we thought it had been eradicated from this country. So can you speak to what this is telling you, not just about South Florida, but about this idea of anti-vax rhetoric that's floating around the country? 
Well, good morning, Willie. This is a serious topic, deserves a serious treatment. Thank you. Uh, this is a big deal because what's happening in Broward County is emblematic of what's happening across the Southeast United States, parts of the country elsewhere as well, which is this misinformation driven by people like the, uh, Laudapo, I won't give him the honorific of doctor. This is now driving parents to say, I'm not going to get the measles shot for, the, for, my for my child. Here's where there's a problem. For kids less than five who are unvaccinated and exposed, potentially po then testing positive for measles, Willie, the, if they test positive, mortality rates can be as high as 12 to 15%. Yes, we went back and forth about how much of a risk COVID was for kids. It's very clear measles is one of the riskiest types of infectious diseases in the world for children that are unprotected. Ladapo is playing with fire here because there's a serious risk that kids are going to end up in the hospital, unvaccinated, unprotected. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. Kindergartners in Broward County that were exposed, unvaccinated. He's telling them, you know what, it's up to you. Uh, you, the parent, to get them vaccinated under 72 hours, that's wrong. That's do, It's violating do no harm. He should be removed from his position. There should be an overseeing body to do that. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. And given the reality right now, the numbers we're seeing right now in Florida, do we expect these numbers to go up? I mean, how do you turn this around at this point? Well, Mika, you know, here's the thing with, with measles. There's hopefully a lot of uh, kiddos and, and families that are that have been vaccinated. Just like with other infectious diseases, there can be asymptomatic or mild presentations of measles that you may not even notice. So mm. I imagine cases are a lot higher than we, we imagine or are seeing right now. But yes, I do expect cases to increase. I, unfortunately, kiddos potentially ending up in the hospital. And here's where there's a problem. Over the course of the last five years, Mika, pediatric bed capacity has declined because pediatric hospitals have shuttered, peds, peds beds have transitioned to adult beds. So as we're seeing more and more vulnerability in kids, we're also seeing less ability of hospitals to care for kids who might end up seriously ill. So we're baking in this vulnerability, have less system capacity to care for these types of situations. And Dr. Gupta, we're now seeing the consequences of a couple of years now, several years, if you want to go back to the beginning of COVID-19, of this vaccine skepticism, all the conspiracy theories that are floating around on the Internet that people have bought into. You have a fairly prominent presidential candidate who staked a lot of his career on that in Robert Kennedy Jr. right now. As you see it, how much of what we're seeing in Florida is the product of all of that garbage? Oh, it's the direct uh, results of it, Willie. Let's let, uh, you and I have had this conversation. Absolutely. I have people reaching out to me saying, hey, who should get the measles vaccine now? People in Florida are wondering. I think many are watching it right now. So he, here, here's here's real information. If you were born before 1957, we're presumed that you're already immunized. If you have ha had known two prior doses of the vaccine, you're OK. If you've been previously exposed, you're OK. If you've had titers confirming immunity, you're OK. If you're unvaccinated or think you've only had one dose, talk to your medical provider. And critically, especially all, all Floridians in Broward County, if you're pregnant and you're unsure, talk mm. to your obstetrician. Really a lot of vulnerability there. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Vin Gupta, I'm sure we'll be talking to you about this again and following up. Thank you very much. Joining us now, MSNBC chief legal correspondent and anchor of The Beat on MSNBC, Ari Melber, and state attorney for Palm Beach County, Florida, Dave Arenberg. I'll ask you both the same question. Dave, I'll start with you. Were you surprised at this ruling? I was shocked, Mika. The five justices who granted the stay, they threw sand in the gears of justice and they further delegitimized the Supreme Court in the eyes of so many. You know, Chief Justice Roberts cares deeply about the perception of the high court. He wants people to believe that they are above politics. That's why it's mystifying to me that they put their hands on a hot stove here. Uh, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals decision was powerful. It was comprehensive. It was convincing. This whole issue of absolute immunity is an easy one. It's a legal layup. It, there's a reason why we left the crown 250 years ago, because we have a president, not a king. So this whole issue is a certain loser for Trump, but he wins by losing, because now it's unlikely that the case will go to trial before the election. Not impossible, just unlikely. And although the Mar-a-Lago documents case, Mika, in my mind as a prosecutor, is the strongest case 
Judge Cannon has slow walked it, and the D.C. case had the right judge, an experienced, no-nonsense Judge Chutkin. It was built for speed with only four counts and no other co-defendants, but not even Jack Smith, a prosecutor's prosecutor, can ensure that the rule of law will prevail. And so a lot of the blame here goes to the Supreme Court, Mika, but some of that is also on the shoulders of risk-averse Merrick Garland. So, uh, Ari Melber, do you agree? Were you shocked? And in a way, one of our guests earlier in the show said this sort of gives him immunity in some ways. Yeah, your question and other guests, as you say, have mentioned, the whole thing is whether this is going to be a process that holds Donald Trump accountable. Accountable doesn't mean he has to be convicted, doesn't mean he's guilty. It means a day in court. Uh, and if a jury of his peers acquits him, good for him. That's the system. Uh, or if he's convicted, then the rest of the United States can understand through this process what it means that somebody got caught trying to steal an election and held accountable before the next one. Uh, the Supreme Court's action, in all likelihood, based on what we know about the calendar, uh, prevents that from happening. So you're having a debate about whether there should be a trial, and the Supreme Court mm -hmm. has prevented a trial. That short circuits the debate. Um, I think, to put it in English, the court thinks it's being savvy, that it could ultimately rule against Trump and say, see how even-handed we are. Um, and in a way, that's right. this Supreme Court thinking that the rest of us are stupid, um, that we don't pay attention, that we can't figure it out, that it'll be a legal cloud of smoke. And so I think, in a way, it's very obvious from how the court is acting on this one um, that they're trying to game it. They think they could do the optics, they can do the PR on it, uh, and still claim afterward that even though they prevented a trial, they still support trials. It's double talk. If we get there, we'll see what they yeah. say. Um, but but I think many might see through it. So it's so interesting. Uh, by the way, we have uh, Jonathan Lemire, Elise Jordan, and Mike Barnacle still with us. And Jonathan, I just I just think it's it's so interesting because, for example, I mean, I respect the court, and and I I doubt that they will come out. I think they'll come out in Trump's favor with the Colorado case. Who knows? Um, but in this case, it was. Is a president immune from having ordering SEAL Team Six to take out one of his opponents? I mean, this is this is not a question that it seems needs a lot of pondering. I don't know if I'm oversimplifying things. Yeah, I mean, the generous approach to this is that they felt like this was a weighty enough matter that they had to weigh in, even if the answer is sort of obvious. They needed to put the stamp of this highest court on the land on it. But in terms of tactics. We are in a campaign year. Uh, this is going to slow things down. Most legal experts we've had on the show this morning have suggested they don't think that even if the Supreme Court acts with some haste, they hear the oral arguments in April, decision comes, let's say, in June, they don't think it will be feasible to get a trial in place before the election, particularly because Judge Chutkin has promised the Trump side uh, plenty of time uh, to prepare. So, so Mike Barnacle, we, you know, there's been this thought among Democrats that Donald Trump always seems to get away with it. Uh, and this seems to be a piece, a step towards him once again getting away with it. There are four trials. He's facing four trials. At this point, it seems at most one, the New York case, which is the least serious of the cases, can happen this year. It seems like the fate of this election and the fate, potentially, of our democracy is not going to be decided in one of these courtrooms. It's going to be in the campaign trail. There's, I think you're absolutely right about that. And, you know, Ari, off of Jonathan's question that he just posed, one of the thoughts that has been rumbling through my diseased mind mm. for the last 24 hours uh, is how did we get here? When you consider over the last eight years the damage that has been done to the true direction of the United States of America, is enormous. And yesterday's news day, I would submit, was packed with irony. It begins in the morning with the announcement by Mitch McConnell that he is retiring. Mitch McConnell, who bagged the United States Supreme Court, who fixed the, the Supreme Court, prevented a president of the United States from naming a Supreme Court justice. Mitch McConnell who with a single wave of his hand could have resulted in getting Donald Trump impeached and thus taken off the board in terms of being still a candidate for president of the United States. And then we have the Supreme Court decision yesterday. And we have the time frame involved. 
The alleged crime was committed on January 6th, 2021. It took an enormous amount of time for Merrick Garland and the Department of Justice to retain Jack Smith as special prosecutor. Over a year's time was lost between the time of the original crime, the alleged crime, and when the special prosecutor took office. And now we have the Supreme Court trying to come up with an answer. Two months from now, they'll start arguments over it. An answer to something that I wonder has ever been posed before. Does a president of the United States have the right to immunity if he shoots and kills someone on Fifth Avenue? Where are we and where are we going mm -hmm. here? Uh, great questions. Mike, where are we? Uh, we're in a tough spot, uh, not just politically with how you may feel about Trump or any other candidate, uh, but as a, as a republic. I think people can feel that. Some people have thrown up their hands and, and been exhausted by it. Others are, are redoubling their efforts. Where are we? Uh, cheating is effective. That's why a lot of people cheat. Violence is effective. You had an earlier segment about Putin, and, and we're talking about this right now. Violence can work. It was violence uh, that has now been convicted as sedition that actually delayed the certification uh, of then president elect Biden. Uh, January 6th was effective. It wasn't a failed plot. It was a plot that resulted in the certification happening later than the constitutional requirement of the 6th. Uh, it could have been even later than that. There were two bombs placed at both party headquarters that did not go off. Um, the Supreme Court through McConnell and other means um, does not reflect anything like uh, a relationship with the people's votes uh, over the years. Uh, and so all of these things have accrued up where cheating and other tactics have been rewarded. Now, whether Donald Trump um, is significantly tied to a deliberate criminal intent on January 6th is supposed to be a legal question, by which I mean, uh, I, as Mika said, I don't think it should be resolved by local politicians on the ballot issue. I don't think it should be resolved at the voting booth because many people may cheer on anti-democratic mm -hmm. efforts by their side. We've seen that in America before. It's supposed to be resolved in the courtroom. And now we have the highest court in the land saying, wait, we're gonna get involved to make sure it probably doesn't get resolved in the courtroom. That's why this has that Orwellian uh, double talk, hypocritical flavor. Um, that's why it's a big problem. Is there a solution to it? Um, not in the short run. I mean, in the long run, we as a country have to look at certain traditions and norms and figure out which ones uh, still work today and which uh, may have been so easily handily beaten through a kind of a cheating, you know, level of video game play by Trump and others where you say, oh, well, the founders didn't expect someone quite like this and they didn't have the rules quite like this. And the Supreme Court uh, seems to think uh, that their press releases, their PR, their sort of effort to say they got involved is more important than actually uh, letting the courts have their say. That's an ironic and deeply hypocritical position if that's where they land. We want to get right to the news. And right now, uh, the funeral for Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny is underway in Moscow. Navalny died in a Russian penal colony on February 16th. His mother then spent eight days trying to get authorities to release his body. It was finally granted after she made a video appeal to President Vladimir Putin. Now the family says the Kremlin is trying to block a pub public funeral and some are worried the services will be disrupted. A heavy police presence can be seen outside the church and cemetery where Navalny will be buried. Joining us now from London is NBC News chief international correspondent Keir Simmons. And Keir, even people who were laying flowers or trying to pay re respects in the wake of Navalny's death were arrested. What's expected today? Well, as we speak, Mika, uh, the funeral is getting underway. Uh, Alexei Navalny's body has arrived at the church, according to his uh, supporters. Uh, <clears throat> and what we're seeing uh, there in Moscow are scenes that in the U.S. would be considered ordinary, and in today's Russia are extraordinary. So organizers say that more than a 1,000 people have arrived outside the church. I just think about uh, the bravery of each one of those people. If they are arrested, uh, that legal case 
can result in a fine or it could be escalated, uh, we estimate, to anything up to 15 years in jail. Each one of those risking that to stand uh, and pay respects, last respects, uh, to Alexei Navalny. Also in the church, ambassadors arriving, including uh, the U.S. Uh, ambassador. Uh, we also have seen uh, in uh, the crowd the families of other jailed opposition leaders. Uh, and uh, Boris Nadishtin, who is uh, one of those who has said that he wants to stand against President Putin in the election in a, in a few weeks' time, and has been, uh, frankly, banned uh, from standing. Uh, the Electoral uh, Commission in Russia deciding that he is not eligible for various uh, reasons. So all of this is happening in the context of President Putin uh, standing for election and, of course, uh, is going to be elected uh, in just uh, a few weeks' time. Uh, Alexei Navalny's wife, Yulia, we don't know where she is. Uh, she uh, obviously has been outside of Russia. Um, she won't be there uh, because she has refused uh, to be silenced. Uh, she has been speaking out even this week, uh, describing her husband's uh, death as uh, that he was killed uh, by uh, President uh, Putin. So uh, uh, this funeral, this, frankly, um, extraordinary funeral, um, is underway right now. That There are reports that there is a lack of uh, mobile coverage, that, that that has been silenced, even as the uh, people there refuse to be. Uh, but Alexei Navalny's team, Mika, are running a, a live broadcast uh, with uh, commentators from his team, uh, live on air, uh, showing pictures, uh, this, a global stream uh, to get the message out. Uh, and and what, a, what a juxtaposition, what a contrast. Yesterday we saw President uh, Putin with a federal address to the, to the nation uh, broadcast on huge screens in Moscow. Uh, now we have this funeral today uh, broadcast on a live stream uh, around the world. And trying to silence him right to the end, as you say, spotty. You can even see it in some of our images. The images are breaking up a little bit, difficult to see in some places. But I guess my question to you, Kier, is, as, as Mika pointed out, the very act of laying flowers at a memorial for Navalny got people arrested. Um, it's hard to really gauge how much support he has. And by support for him, it also implies criticism of Vladimir Putin, because it is a crime, effectively, to do such a thing. What is your sense covering Russia so closely for all these years of the level of sympathy for Alexei Navalny and his cause within Russia? Look, we've said it many times really, right? That there are many Russians who are sympathetic. There are also many Russians who support President Putin, not least because they think that President Putin hauled Russia out of the absolute chaos of the 1990s, and they, they still remember that, and, and they are still grateful for that, if you like. That's the reality of the politics in Russia. But let me answer your question a different way, if you like. Uh, how much of a threat does Alexei Navalny, or did Alexei Navalny pose? And I suppose you could say, does Alexei Navalny pose to the Kremlin in the Kremlin's own eyes? Well, uh, Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesman, was asked today by journalists whether he now had anything to say uh, to Alexei Navalny's uh, family. And he says, the, he answers, I'm just going to look down and quote this, the Kremlin doesn't have anything to say to Navalny's family uh, on the day of his uh, mm. funeral. So uh, when I interviewed President Putin, uh, you know, some years ago now, he, and, and it, happens, it happens again and again whenever he's asked about Alexei Navalny, he doesn't even want to say his name. I think the, the danger for the, for the Kremlin now, if you like, I mean, there's no question who's going to win the election in a few weeks' time. But the danger, I think, that the Kremlin itself uh, will see uh, is that y you now have his widow, uh, Yulia, um, traveling around the world, uh, giving these speeches, uh, taking up the mantle, if you like. Um, and so um, the reason why they will be concerned with this funeral today is because they will be concerned, let's put it this way, uh, that Alexei Navalny hasn't been turned into effectively a martyr. Moment, but we want to pause because funeral services for Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, Navalny have just wrapped up in Moscow. The 47-year-old's body now headed to a nearby cemetery where Navalny will be laid to rest. Crowds have gathered outside to watch this procession. Navalny, of course, died two weeks ago in a Russian penal colony. Joining us now from London, NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons. Keir, what more can you tell us? 
Well, Willie, I, I said an hour ago uh, that these images that we would consider ordinary in the U.S. are extraordinary in today's Russia, and, and that's even more so now. Uh, there is now a, an image of Alexei Navalny uh, in... Uh, an open coffin uh, inside the church. His parents, among those uh, gathered around him, the U.S. ambassador is there too uh, with other uh, diplomats. The Russian authorities harassing supporters right to the end uh, this morning, releasing the, the body later than promised. But these scenes outside the church are as stunning, frankly, as what we are seeing inside the church, because um, as his uh, coffin was carried into the church, as he arrived, uh, we heard uh, people shouting, calling out, Navalny. I'm just pausing there because you can, you can hear them. Um, just remember that every one of those people in that crowd, and the organizers say uh, that that is more than a thousand people there, that every one of them are, are, are risking uh, jail, potentially a fine, uh, but they're risking arrest, potentially a fine, potentially a uh, jail, simply uh, to be there. The, the Kremlin making it clear that it is against the law, as, as it said, to attend unauthorized gatherings, and has said that uh, any gathering outside of the church itself uh, is not legal. Uh, so uh, the Kremlin not commenting this morning again, once again, on, on uh, Navalny's death. Uh, but Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov asked whether he has anything to say to the family, said, no, we don't have anything uh, to mm. say to them. Uh, 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 extraordinary scenes. And, and you mentioned that the, that the service is now uh, over. Uh, though that crowd that you heard chanting Navalny, uh, they're now chanting, we will not forgive you. Hmm. As you said, it's in Putin's Russia, an act of courage just to attend the funeral. We had reports from Navalny's family that some funeral directors said they could not prepare the body. They would not prepare the body or organize the funeral because of concerns around their own safety. NBC's Keir Simmons covering the funeral of Alexei Navalny for us this morning. Thanks so much, Keir. And joining us.